How are you doing, everyone? Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Nir Arad from Waves Radio is going to talk to us about controlling Apple with snakes. Uh, take it away, Anya. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. It's my first PyCon talk. Uh, I decided to keep it simple um, and not do fancy stuff. Who am I kidding? I brought an iPad for a live demo. <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk about Appium and how you can control your iOS or um, mobile applications using uh, Python. So I want you all to put yourself in the shoes of a QA manual tester. Your job is to run regression tests on all of the company's products. Tests are tedious and repeat themselves. And you probably ask yourself, uh, why am I doing this job? Why am I doing a machine's job? Well, this is pretty much the exact um, question I've been asking myself. Basically, it's my story. I started uh, sound engineering. And I started working 10 years ago at Waves Audio. It's an audio um, software company for the pro and consumer um, market. And we're going to go over their, some of their products later. Um, so I've been doing five years of manual testing. And I got tired from that. I wanted to do some more interesting stuff. And I said, OK, why not? automate the boring and tedious work. So for the past five years, I've been working with Python, um, automating stuff, uh, automating tests, and running tests for desktop applications and mobile applications. So what are audio plugins? Basically, they're a set of tools to help sound engineers, music producers, and musicians create better mixes for their songs and records, and even live performances. Uh, there are many tools such as equalizers, compressors, reverbs. Here you see uh, modeling of uh, a tape machine used in Abbey Road Studios. Um, there's also great stuff like uh, guitar amps. And well, you probably know this one. If you don't know the song, the audio plugins pretty much revolutionized and changed the way we make music forever. Uh, this is a plugin called uh, Waves Tune, and basically what it does, it sh fixes the tune of a singer um, in live. So, back to our talk. Why do we use automated testing? Well, Waves Audio specifically has more than 200 products, and we have to test them every day. And we're even using uh, continuous integration and continuous build, so we have to test them pretty much every hour. Um, it's not possible for a human to do that. And we prefer to leave the humans, the QA, do more intelligent testing. Uh, things that are more dynamic and require them to adapt and to really think about that. Um, so automated testing is boring, and it should be done by machines. The benefits of automated testing, well, first, it saves you time. Um, it runs 24-7, and you get immediate results. They run much faster than humans. Tests like uh, benchmark testing or um, stress testing are not possible to be done by humans. Try measuring the CPU 30 times per second. You're going to need a tool to do that. They're more accurate. They always run the same, pretty much. Um, there's no human error. They're reusable. We can use actually write functions that are reusable from one test to another. And most of all, they can increase our coverage for better and faster releases. We can catch bugs, uh, bugs earlier. So Waves Audio has been making applications for the desktop 
platforms, Windows and Mac, and some on Linux for years now. And in the past year, we I was addressed with a challenge. Um, Wave started uh, producing audio plugins for the iPad, for the iOS platform. And I was given a task to basically transfer our facilities, our testing facilities, from the desktop to the iOS. And I have to address another issue that Waves is not an app developer. We don't actually have an app. We are called a third party plugin developer. That means that our products are basically an in app purchase. So, in order to test it, we don't even have an app. We're tested on um, foreign apps, or what we did is we created a testing app ourselves. This is a basic app um, that can basically has a, a select plugin, which is going to open a menu so you can select your plugin. It has a select song and play. I'm going to show it to you later. So our journey begins. First, we came to Test Flight. It's the main uh, testing framework by Apple. You can use it to create distinct IDs for an app, get your certificates, and basically it's your one-way gate to the App Store. You have to get your app approved before you launch it on the App Store. Uh, you can also use it for internal testing or external beta tests. Best mm, beta testing, um, but it on only supports real devices, and it doesn't support Python. Automated testing does exist, but you have to know Objective C, and it's really really hard. So our tests pretty much uh, failed or crashed, and then we came to Appium. It's an open source project uh, for automated testing. It supports native web or hybrid applications. Native being an application that is uh, built specifically for the, um, the mobile platform. And it's running on a native environment. Web applications are basically apps running inside of a browser. And hybrid applications are native application frames that has a web application inside of it. Uh, think of uh, maybe f Facebook app has a lot of hybrid um, applications inside of it. It's open source and ready to use. Um, Appium is produced by Sauce Labs, which also has um, num numerous uh, other products in the field of uh, automated testing. So how does Appium work? Basically, it's a Node.js server running on the test machine, which is our Mac, for example. And it's an HTTP, um, it's an HTTP server, and you can communicate with your from your test to the to the server using the JSON protocol. From there, commands are sent to the device. Um, using some something called the web driver, aka the Selenium web driver. So the web driver sits as an app inside the device and it communicates back to the server and what it does, it um, translates the commands from what the user wrote in Python to the native environment framework. And this happens back and forth. Um, Appium uses um, a layer called Instruments App inside the, um, the iOS mobile platform. On Android, they have a different uh, they have a different way to do that. And basically, it utilizes the libraries of the native device in order to control and automate the uh, the device itself. So we have two options when automating devices with Appium. We can use a real device, like this one. It's much more stable. You get a real device performance. Basically, your app is going to act the exact same way it did um, because it's a real device. It's going to act the same uh, as it will 
with the user. However, it's much more expensive. You actually have to buy an iPad. It's got a slow response time. The app has to be copied from the machine into the device. And every command has to be sent back and forth. That can take time. And it needs to be updated. It can break. And that's pretty much the disadvantages. The emulated device um, is a virtual device sitting inside the testing machine. It's much faster. There's no data transfer. Um, easier to maintain. It's free. And on Android, you can run it concurrently. However, it's, it's much less stable. Um, it tends to crash from time to time. And basically, it's not the real thing. You're not getting the real performance for better or for worse. For that reason and many others, uh, we chose to use a real device to do our tests. Basically, it's much more stable. So um, in order to connect from Appium to the device, we need to create a session. Session are defined by desired capabilities. And basically, it's our connection to Appium. Desired capabilities are a set of keys and values that tell Appium what kind of automation session is required. You can set up things like language, locale, new command timeout, and even browser name. For this demonstration, I've set um, our orientation to landscape. I gave Appium the path to our app, so it will know how to, where to get it from and how to copy it to the device. And of course, we're using iOS version 11 and I also gave the Appium our UDID, which is the device unique ID, so it'll know to which device to connect to. So doing that in Python is pretty simple. You instantiate a dictionary. You fill it up with all the information that you want. And all you have to do is inst instantiate in one line of code, you have to instantiate your driver. Once you do that, automatically, Appium is going to copy your app from the machine onto the device and launch the, um, launch the app itself. So now we're, we have a connection ready. We're ready to start our test. And we do that by using GUI elements. Because WebDriver uses basically Selenium, so you have the same, uh, um, say, the same language um, as any other uh, test that you wrote for web applications. So we have a few strategies. Uh, we can locate elements by class name, like buttons, dialogues, sliders, etc. We can use the accessibility ID, which uh, is a unique ID for each uh, control. In, in the GUI, or we can use uh, locators such as name or XPath, which are uh, slower and are not really recommended unless you don't really know what to look for. In order to uh, fetch the accessibility IDs of each of the controls, uh, you can use Appium Desktop. It's a desktop application that you can connect to your device and basically see the tree of all the controls and elements in the GUI. So our test is simple. Uh, we want to press the select plugin uh, button. That's going to open a menu like you saw before. And we want to iterate through each and every one of the plugins. And what we want to do with each of the plugins is basically run an image comparison test. Take a screenshot, copy it back to our Mac, and see if the image match against a reference build, which is basically a build that is uh, used by our users. Now, take a look at the two images. The top one is the reference, and the bottom one is the new. And raise your hand if you can see one difference between them. Okay, good. 
Now, keep your hands up if you can see more than two differences. This can be pretty hard. <laughs> Good. Uh, so humans are not really built to do some uh, very accurate tests and accuracy counts because I can tell you that in one of the changes, we have a change that's only one pixel large. And what you're seeing here is what the test created. On the top image, you see a diff image. Basically, we took a black photo and we colored the images in green, uh, green pixels for every pixel that it's different from the original one. And on the bottom photo, what you see is basically the original image, but with inverted pixels. Every pixel that's different from the original reference, we basically uh, color the inverted color. So that's the answer. Sure, you got it right. And we're going to move on. This is our test code for running the test. Basically, once we've instantiated the driver, we need to find the select plugin button, uh, which is on top. We use it by the accessibility ID that we fetched earlier. And then we click on the menu. Next, we want to iterate through the menu and find out every plugin, every plugin button that's listed there so we can click on them. Uh, we use XPath for that reason. And once we iterate through every plugin, we can take a screenshot. It's going to copy it to our Mac. And then we can compare the images. Now, the comparison function is pretty straightforward and not very um, fancy or sexy. Um, basically, what it does, it opens the two images as a bitmap pixel matrix with each pixel represented by an RGB tuple. Basically, it's a number between 0 and 255. They represent color for R, G, and B. And we iterate through every row and every column in the photo. And we check if the color of the pixel is the same based on our reference. If it's not, then we take the black image and we paint a green pixel. We take the original uh, photo and we basically paint an inverted color on that location. So you can see the test results for our little test. Uh, just over 9,000 pixels are different between these images. Now, don't take my word for it. I'm going to show you. This is, by the way, Dimitri. He's a demo god. For every demo, he requires a sacrifice. So I hope my sacrifice was good enough to run our test well. Now, what you see here, apart from the screen, oh, sorry. Close that. OK, on top, you see the latest invention by Apple. It's called QuickTime. It's going to represent this iPad here. This is actual video. This is not animation or anything. And here we have our script in PyCharm. I'm just going to raise it up a little. Um, OK. So we can start our script. Uh, what it does, it launches the Appium server. Oh, yes. Launches the Appium server as a subprocess. And once it does, it's going to copy the app uh, from the Mac onto the device. And once it's done, it's going to iterate through every plugin. So it opened the first plugin, and then it's going to open the next one. OK, got the menu. OK, good. So I didn't actually do anything uh, or touch the iPad. All right, let's do some uh, more uh, exciting stuff. Well, touch screens behave very differently than a mouse. They have gestures. 
you can swipe, you can tap, you can enlarge and do a lot of stuff. Um, in order to automate this, Appium gives us a touch action object. Basically, it contains a chain of events that simulates action as a user on the screen. So what you see here is a touch action where you press on an element and then move it and then release. You can also do positional based actions. And Appium gives you all these actions such as press, release, you can move, tap, or wait. In order to do more elaborate um, uh, gestures, Appium uses the multi-touch uh, object, which basically it's a collection of touch actions. What it does, uh, you, you get only two functions, add and perform. When you run add, basically it's adding the action that you want to run onto the, um, say, a list, and it collects all the actions that you want to run. Once you run perform, it's going to send all the commands at once to the iPad or your device, and basically it's going to run them sequently, and it's not going to spend time sending each request um, separately. So. Let's see that in action. What I want to do is basically um, select a song. And oh, where's my mouse? There it is. OK. So I'm going to open a little plugin called HDelay. Um, it's a delay plugin. And it has a, a button called Tap Tempo. So you can actually click on the, on the button to measure or to set the delay time uh, based on your tempo. So uh, first we want to select a song and get rid of that uh, notification center. Um, notification dialog, thank you. I'm a jazz fan, so I'm going to pick uh, a Dave Brubeck song. And we can hear it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to let Appium sync the tempo. It's going to tap, and you can hear the delay changing. Now, this is not a very consistent test. Uh, as you can see, the delay changed a bit more. It's not actually pressing at the same time. It's not synced up to the tempo. I'm going to stop the song. Uh, and the reason is that because we didn't use multi-actions. I just used touch action sending each and each command. So um, a bit about the Appium philosophy. Most importantly, um, you shouldn't recompile or modify your app. This can introduce a risk of bugs, or maybe even you can miss bugs that your automation is not using um, a certain feature that the user is using. Appium also states that you shouldn't be locked into a specific language to run your test or a framework. Basically, it's an HTTP server, so it can run on any platform, on any um, language, including Python. A mobile automation framework shouldn't reinvent the wheel when it comes to automation APIs. Basically, what it means is they're using proprietary um, web driver Selenium, which is also done by, um, by SAS Labs. And lastly, a mobile automation framework should be open source in spirit. And that's why we're all here to collaborate and help Python grow. I'm going to give you some final tips on, auto on creating your automated tests. First, try to divide your test into separate chunks. Uh, don't create one giant test that is going to test your app from one end to the other, because if you get a failure, you're going to have to debug the test. If you have, let's say, 50 tests doing s very small parts, and let's say that 15 of them failed, you already have a 
reasonable understanding on how it failed or at what areas. Next, uh, try to choose tests that take a long time to complete. Lately, we've written a test that it took 12 hours to run, but it took a human being a week's, a week's pay to complete it manually. So we actually saved a week uh, in running it overnight. You have to consider the next item. If you're using a reference for your test, a reference data, if it's images, audio files, database, XMLs, whatever, uh, make sure that you know and you are aware these are going to be changed once the products change. And if you need to do a lot of work, um, a lot of tests, then maybe you need to consider tests that are that don't use a reference that can actually figure for themselves. And lastly, not every test is suitable as an automated test. As I said before, um, manual testing should be intelligent testing that you have to um, think about and adapt. And my last item that I want to present to you is this. Automated testing is an insurance policy. The more you test, the more you're covered. So here are some links and sources. Uh, first, the Appium website is very informative. It's got a lot of documentation about how to run Appium, how to set it up. Um, there's a nice uh, ebook by Nishan Verma for the Android. Uh, I didn't talk about Android, but basically uh, it applies the same API, so your code is going to work on both iOS and Android, the same code. And also, if you want to introduce your app into the App Store, then you're going to have to read, or I, I recommend you reading a uh, blog by Daniel Matthews uh, about test flight and produ producing apps to the App Store. And you're free to um, come and see me later um, if you have a talk, if you have questions or anything. Uh, you're free to go to the Waves website and see some cool plugins that we do. So thank you.